Hello history fans and welcome to today's revision video. We are just going to be reading the Edexcel exam board um, section, the smallest section, which I can't believe is a full section. So if this is the wrong bit, I apologise, but it's the British sector of the Western Front, 1914 to 1918. I'm just going to read through those pages today. Please obviously don't take this as your only form of revision. This is just to help you a little bit because when I was revising, I remember watching lots of videos because hearing people say it over and over was helpful. So let's just get going. The British sector of the Western Front 1914 to 1918. Trench warfare on the Western Front. Between 1914 and 1918, the Allies, including Britain, France and Belgium, fought the German Imperial Army in Belgium and France. The area where the fighting happened was called the Western Front. The war on the Western Front was mostly fought in the trenches. In the autumn of 1914, the Germans and the Allies realised that they couldn't beat each other outright. Instead of retreating, they built a line of trenches that stretched through northern France to the coast of Belgium. These trench lines were developed through the war, but their position mostly stayed the same. In July 1916, the British tried to break through the German line in an area called the Somme. Lots of lives were lost during this offensive. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, there were almost 60,000 British casualties. 20,000 of these were killed. There were only 174 medical officers treating tens of thousands of serious casualties in the first week of the battle. Many men died because they had to wait for days before being treated. In 1917, mines were used at Arras and Ypres. That's the one that spelt like white press. <laughs> If that helped you remember it. <laughs> Mines were used at Arras and Ypres to break through the enemy line. The aim was to avoid losses like those at the Somme by making it easier for the infantry to attack the enemy trenches. The army also tried to improve medical care after the casualties of the Somme overwhelmed medical staff. In 1917, more medical posts were set up to prepare for casualties before a big offensive on the Ypres salient. A salient is where one side's line pushes into the other side's line. Their territory gets surrounded by the enemy on three sides. During the Third Battle of Ypres, from July to November 1917, there were over 200,000 casualties. This time, there were 379 medical officers, so many men were treated earlier than those at the Somme. By April 1917, the Germans had retreated to the Hindenburg Line. In November 1917, at the Battle of Cambrai, the Allies broke its defences with tanks, but they lost this ground again later. There were about 45,000 British casualties, fewer than at the Somme, but still a high number. Before the Battle of Cambrai, a blood bank was set up by Captain Robertson, he realised that it would be easier to save lives during the battle if they had already had a supply of blood. Trenches were designed to protect soldiers from enemy attack. Most trenches were dug down into the ground and their upper level was fortified with sandbags. In wet areas, trenches were built upwards using sandbags full of clay. These were called breastworks. Ideally, trenches were about six or seven foot deep. Mounds of earth were built from the side of the trench to split it into sections. These were called traverses. Trenches were constructed by entrenching lots of soldiers in a line digging straight into the ground. Sapping, one man digging outwards from the end of the trench. Or tunnelling, like sapping, but a layer of earth was left along the top of the trench until it was finished. The parados was a mound of earth or sandbags that raised the height of the back of the trench. It was designed to protect soldiers from shell explosions behind the trench. The floors of trenches in wet areas were often lined using wooden boards called duck boards. The parapet was built up in a similar way to the parados on the front side of the trench. It was meant to be bulletproof and was lined with wooden planks, netting and sandbags. Fire trenches, trenches closest to the enemy, had a firing step held back by wooden planks. Men could stand on here behind the bulletproof parapet 
and fire their rifles into no man's land. Barbed wire was set in front of the trenches to make it harder for enemy infantry to attack head on. The ground between the front line trenches of each side was called no man's land. Trench systems were expanded during the war. This had a big impact on the terrain of the Western Front. Trenches were often organised in parallel lines. According to one 1916 training manual, trenches were ideally built in three parallel lines. Saps were small trenches that pushed out into no man's land. The support trench was about 60 to 90 metres behind the front trench. This protected it from shell bombardment aimed at the front line. It was connected to the front line trench by communication trenches. Soldiers could retreat to the support trench and the support trench reinforced the front line. The front line had two trenches. The fire trench faced the enemy. The supervision trench was used to move along the line behind the fire trench. They had zigzag or step shaped sections separated by traverses. This stopped enemy infantry from firing along the trench and contained explosions from shells in small areas. Communication trenches connected the trench lines to each other and to local roads and army depots behind the line. The reserve trench was about 350 to 550 metres behind the front line. It was made up of dugouts, shelters that protected four to six men, or line trenches. Reinforcements waited here so they could counter enemy attacks. This image shows an ideal trench system. In reality, building such organised trenches was hard. They might be built quickly as troops advanced. Terrain had to be considered too. Trench maps drawn during the war showed that lines were often far more complicated. Underground warfare was a key feature of the Western Front. Both sides tunnelled under no man's land to reach enemy trenches. It was dangerous for tunnellers who could be buried, suffocate or meet the enemy but it was less costly than a normal infantry attack through no man's land. In 1916, the Allies built a tunnel network under Arras by extending existing caves, quarries and mines. It had electricity, accommodation and a hospital. In April 1917, it was used to hide 24,000 men before the Battle of Arras. Tunnels were dug up to the German lines so men could reach the enemy trenches in safety. The entrances were blown open with mines at the start of the battle. Lots of ground was won on the first day. However, the British suffered over 150,000 casualties during the battle. At the Battle of Messines on Ypres Ceylon in June 1917, 19 mines were blown up under the German line. Around 10,000 German soldiers died instantly. Two of the mines were used to destroy defences on hills, Hill 60 and the Caterpillar they would have been hard to attack head-on without heavy losses. Trench maps are a good source for studying the layout of trenches and their defences. They're more realistic than the ideal layout in training manuals. They were drawn up by using photos taken from the air. Teams on the ground collected information too. They don't always give the full picture though. For example, machine gun placements were often deliberately hidden and could be missed by planes. Trench warfare damaged terrain and transport networks. Shelling and entrenchment damaged roads and terrain on the Western Front. The British Army used motor and horse-drawn vehicles to move supplies towards the front from supply dumps near railway lines, but the muddy, shell-damaged terrain was hard to negotiate. Railways became important for moving supplies and troops around behind the front lines, but they weren't always near the front. By 1917, the British had built a light railway network behind the lines. Other Allied armies had done this already. They made it easier to move supplies, ammunition and men through muddy and damaged terrain, and to evacuate wounded men from the front. It was hard to evacuate wounded men from the front lines quickly. Stretcher bearers often had to carry casualties down communication trenches or through a series of relay posts. This delayed wounded treatment. The RAMC and the FANY the fighting on the Western Front disrupted local transport networks. The British Army was supported by various medical units who treated wounded men and evacuated them from the front line. The Royal Army Medical Corps, RAMC, ran field ambulances. Field ambulance transport included teams of stretcher bearers, horses, wagons and carts, and motor ambulances. The RAMC started using these in 1915. 
Moving casualties away from the front to be treated was a problem. The terrain had become very muddy. The RAMC, field ambulances, these were units, not vehicles, set up mobile medical stations. Stretcher bearers carried casualties through a series of relay posts until they reached a medical post or somewhere they could be moved by rail, road or river. The RAMC field ambulances created a chain of evacuation. Men were more likely to survive if their wounds were treated quickly. The RAMC developed a system to move wounded men who had a chance of surviving to medical areas. This was called the chain of evacuation. A regimental aid post, RAP, was set up a few metres behind the front line in a shell hole or dugout. They gave first aid. Men who needed more treatment walked or were carried by stretcher bearers to an advanced dressing station. Advanced dressing stations were ideally set up around 350 metres from the RAP in tents, dugouts or large buildings. Main dressing stations were set up about one mile behind the advanced dressing stations. They collected injured men from the RAP using horse-drawn ambulances and stretcher bearers. Seriously injured men were moved to casualty clearing stations. Casualty clearing stations collected seriously injured men from the main dressing stations using motor ambulance convoys. They had surgical and medical wards in wooden huts, nursing staff, and were sometimes supported by mobile x-ray units. Men could be treated for up to four weeks before being moved to a base hospital or sent back to the front. Base hospitals were designed to take up to 400 patients. They were often turned into specialist hospitals to treat common injuries and ailments, like the effects of gas. They were set up in large buildings and were often close to transport networks. They also had x-ray departments. They treated patients until they could be sent back to the front or sent home to Britain. The FANY provided transport services to the Allied armies. The women of the First Aid Nursing Yeomany Corps, FANY, were trained in first aid, veterinary skills, signalling and driving. They mainly worked as a field ambulance, moving wounded men between base hospitals, medical posts, trains, barges and hospital ships. The FANY staffed two key ambulance convoys, the Calais Convoy and the St Omer Convoy. The driving skills of the FANY were very useful to the army, as they needed to move supplies, wounded men and rations between coastal ports and the front line. One FANY driver called Beryl Hutchinson, who was part of the St Omer Convoy, described her role in her memoirs. She had to pick up wounded men from trains and drive them to base hospitals or to boats that would take them back to Britain. The driving skills of the FANY were pretty useful when it came to transporting men who were very badly wounded. They had to drive as smoothly as possible so the men wouldn't be jolted around. Canal barges were used to move the worst cases. The FANY had many roles. They ran a mobile soup kitchen and a mobile bathing vehicle, staffed hospitals and convalescent homes, ran a hospital canteen and organised concerts for the troops. This is a very sad module. Conditions in the trenches. Life in the trenches exposed soldiers to lots of illnesses and infections. They were also at risk of gas attacks. Bad conditions in the trenches caused illness. Soldiers were exposed to the weather in the trenches. Many suffered from exposure to the cold and frostbite. Trench foot was a condition caused by standing in flooded trenches for too long. Skin and tissue on the feet broke down. It could become gangrenous. Doctors used amputation to stop the gangrene from spreading. Trench foot was more common at the start of the war. By 1915, there were fewer cases as soldiers had to change their socks frequently. They also put whale oil on their feet to create a waterproof layer. Dysentery caused diarrhea and dehydration. Dirty water and unhygienic latrines Holes about four or five feet deep that served as toilets helped the disease to spread. The trenches were also full of vermin that spread diseases like rats, lice, maggots and flies. Trench fever and typhus were spread by body lice. It could take 12 weeks to recover. Doctors didn't make the link between lice and trench fever until 1918. Delousing stations were set up to try and stop outbreaks of these diseases, but they weren't always successful. It was hard to remove lice eggs from the soldiers' clothing. Both sides use gas attacks to disable soldiers. Four main types of gas were weaponised during the war. The effects of each could be devastating. 
lacrimatory gas from 1914, also known as tear gas. It caused inflammation of the nose, throat and lungs and blindness. It was meant to disable soldiers or force them to retreat rather than kill them. Mustard gas from July 1917, a blistering agent that caused blisters, burning and breathing difficulties. Extended exposure to it could cause blindness and lung infections. It ate away at the body from the inside and it could take up to five weeks for a victim to die. The gas could also cling to clothes for hours, which put medical staff at risk too. Chlorine gas from April 1915. Chlorine gas was the first deadly gas used on the Western Front. It was a killing agent that slowly suffocated its victims. A medical officer for the French described its effects at White at Eeps. I felt the action of the gas on my respiratory system. It burned in my throat, caused pains in my chest and made breathing all but impossible. I spat blood and suffered from dizziness. We all thought we were lost. That was April 1915. Phosgene from December 1915. This gas caused suffocation. Phosgene had a, had a mild scent and was colourless, so it was hard to detect. It could take over 24 hours for symptoms to set in. Trench warfare could also cause emotional trauma. In the trenches, soldiers were exposed to lots of death, destruction and artillery bombardment. Living in these harsh conditions could cause a psychological illness called shell shock. Symptoms of shell shock can include tiredness, blindness, hearing loss, shaking and mental breakdown. Doctors disagreed over whether it was caused by unseen physical injuries or by emotional trauma. Shell shock meant two different things. When an explosion shocked the central nervous system causing brain damage or an emotional disorder caused by a traumatic trench environment. After the Battle of the Somme in 1916, there was an increase in shell shock cases. Doctors started to evacuate these cases to specialist hospitals. However, the emotional trauma caused by trench warfare wasn't really understood until later in the war. Even then, many with shell shock were seen as cowards. Wounds and injuries. Trench warfare caused horrific injuries on a scale doctors had not seen before the war. Soldiers were often wounded by gunfire and shell explosions. Machine guns and rifles caused gunshot wounds, bruises, fractured bones and organ damage. Trenches often protected the body, but the head was exposed. The army were alarmed at the number of sever and severity of head injuries. They saw injuries like shrapnel embedded in the brain, skull fractures, large scalp cuts and brain damage. In 1915, metal Brody helmets were issued. Before this, many head injuries were fatal. The helmet skates gave soldiers a better chance of surviving, but treatment was still limited. American surgeon Dr Harvey Cushing treated head injuries during the war. He pioneered new surgical techniques that were still being used in the 1970s. His techniques halved the number of deaths caused by brain surgery during the war. He used x-rays to find shrapnel in the brain and drew it out using magnets. His efforts were limited by slow evacuation and lack of brain imaging techniques. Shrapnel, which is metal objects and fragments from ex explosions, caused horrific facial injuries and could kill instantly. Shrapnel shells were blown open in the air using a small fuse. They were filled with bullets and metal balls which flew out and hit soldiers. Other shells were designed to explode violently. The cases of these high explosive shells broke into large jagged pieces of shrapnel that tore through flesh. Dr Harold Gillies, a British surgeon, treated serious facial injuries at Queen Mary's Hospital in Sidcup during and after the war. He developed a plastic surgery technique called the tube pedicle, which made skin grafting and facial reconstructions more effective. Soldiers could also get concussion from shell explosions, be hit by flying debris, buried under collapsed buildings and trenches, or poisoned by carbon monoxide from blasts, which then collected in air pockets. Wound infection was a big problem. Many trenches were dug in farmland, which was covered in bacteria from fertilisers. In Flanders, drainage ditches had been destroyed by shelling, so trenches were often waterlogged and bacteria thrived. The ground was also infected by unhygienic latrines and thousands of bodies that were left to decompose or were buried in shallow graves near the trenches. 
There were numerous dugouts, and these so filthy that our men could not occupy them. The bottom of the trenches were paved with dead, all Germans so far as we could learn, and very badly decomposed. That's an extract from the 10th Canadian Battalion's War Diary, describing conditions in a French trench on the Ypsilon in April 1915. Wounded men often had to lie in the contaminated mud of trenches or no man's land for hours or days before being picked up by stretcher bearers. They were at risk of getting serious infections like tetanus and gas gangrene. These were fatal without treatment. Infections could also cause sepsis. Every gunshot wound of this war in France and Belgium is more or less infected at the moment of its infliction. Mud and dirt pervade everything and bacteriological investigations of the soil, of the clothing and of the skin demonstrate the presence of the most dangerous pathogenic organisms in all three. And that's an extract from 1916, a lecture by British Army surgeon Sir Anthony Bowlby. Doctors like Bowlby realised that every wound was likely to be infected. This was a big problem for the army, as those with only minor injuries were still at risk of dying from a fatal infection. There were a few ways to fight infection at the start of the war. Anti-tetanus serum was given to injured soldiers on the front line to prevent tetanus. Wounds were thoroughly washed in an antiseptic solution called carbolic lotion, closed up and wrapped in bandages soaked in carbolic acid. A paraffin paste called BIP was used to cover wounds and prevent infection. Before antibiotics were discovered in the 1920s, amputation of wounded arms, legs, hands or feet was a common way to stop life-threatening infections from spreading. And the final page. Developments in surgery and medicine. During the war, doctors developed new techniques for dealing with serious injuries and infections. The number of deaths from wound infection was reduced. In the 19th century, surgeons tried to avoid germs getting into wounds. This was called aseptic surgery. They started to disinfect their hands before surgery and wear surgical gloves. They also sterilised their operating theatres and instruments to get rid of germs. Antiseptics like carbolic acid were used to kill germs and prevent wound infection. However, wound treatment was still very basic before the war. Doctors quickly explored the wound for objects that needed removing, then washed the wound with antiseptic and sewed it up. This was called primary closure. During the war, a Belgian doctor called Antonine de Page developed a better way to treat wounds. He treated every wound as if it was already infected. There were two main steps to his treatment. One, the wound was properly and thoroughly explored and objects like shrapnel or bits of clothing were removed. De Page also realised that removing all damaged tissue and then washing the wound with antiseptic decreased the chance of infection. Two, De Page left the wound open to the air for about 24 to 48 hours. Next, he looked at a swab of the wound under a microscope to check for bacteria. If the wound wasn't infected, then he closed it up. This was called delayed primary closure. These improvements in wound treatment saved many men from having amputations just to stop infections from spreading. Allied surgeons also used these techniques to improve the chances of surviving an amputation. In 1915, Alexis Carroll and Henry Dakin developed a new way to prevent infection. Dakin created an antiseptic solution that could be flushed into a wound using rubber tubes before closure. This technique was called irrigation. DePage used this method as part of his wound treatment. Fracture treatment was improved by x-ray, x-rays and splints. Before x-ray machines, surgeons had to look for shrapnel by hand, putting their patients at risk of infection. X-ray machines made aseptic surgery more effective because the surgeon didn't have to touch the wound to find shrapnel and bone fragments. Wilhelm Röntgen discovered X-rays in 1895. During the war, hospitals used X-ray machines to find broken bones and shrapnel. The British had 528 X-ray units. 14 of these were mobile units. They took mobile X-ray machines and radiographers to casualty clearing stations so men could be treated closer to the front line. At the start of the war, 80% of men who suffered a fractured femur, thigh bone, in the trenches died. A surgeon called Robert Jones treated this injury using the Thomas splint. The Thomas splint was strapped around the broken leg before the casualty was moved. This stopped the leg from moving so that it was protected from more damage. 
By 1915, only 20% of soldiers with this kind of injury died. In 1917, Robert Jones released a book, influenced by his war experience, advising doctors in Britain on how to treat complicated shoulder, leg, arm, spinal and pelvic fractures. It explained how to use splints to treat certain fractures. Blood transfusions were used to treat blood loss. Blood loss caused many deaths during the war. British doctors transfused blood from one person to another. Direct transfusion but it was a slow process and not always successful. A new method called syringe cannula technique was developed. Doctors took blood from a donor using a needle and syringe and transfused it into their patient quickly. It was tricky to carry out as blood could clot in the syringe. In 1917, a US Army doctor called Captain Oswald Robertson argued that it would be better to collect blood before it was needed. As a result, the first blood bank was set up in preparation for the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. In 1914, it was discovered that adding sodium citrate to blood stopped clotting so it could be stored. In 1916, blood was added to a citrate glucose solution so it could be stored on ice for about 10 to 14 days. And then it gives you a little checklist of your revision summary and some exam skills and tips i hope that helped some of you um thank you very much for watching please subscribe if you're new and give the video a thumbs up and i'll see you next time bye bye